Okay, so welcome to Portrait of an Artist and Poet. And I'm Gloria Mindock, editor of Santa Barbara Press. And today our guest is Lila Musselman. And she is an award-winning poet, playwright, and visual artist. Her work has appeared in Pank, Flying Island, the Tipton Poetry Review, the New Verse News, Rose Court Magazine, and the, I can't say that word, ekphrastic. <laughs> ekphrastic. <laughs> is hard. <laughs> and many other journals. She has specialized in portraits, specifically pet portraits, and acrylics, watercolor, and dry media. Um, she has exhibited her work throughout the U.S. at cat shows, dog shows, pet expos, and her work has been exhibited throughout the Midwest also. She is the author of five chat books, including Red Mare 16, and co-author of a volume of poetry, Company of Women, New and Selected Poems. And she's the author of a full-length poetry collection, It's Not Love, Unfortunately, by Chatterhouse Press. And she currently is working on a lot of poetry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I give you Lylan. Well, thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much for having me. It's quite an honor to be here. And thank you for showing up on this nice day for a lot of you. And on a Saturday, sometimes everybody has things to do on Saturday, but you're going to share, hear me share some poems with you. And so without further ado, I'll get started. I will say that um, all these poems are relatively new. They're within the last year or so. They're not in any of my books. Uh, a couple of them have been published already, but um, otherwise I probably won't talk a whole lot in between except for maybe if I switch gears or there's something that needs to be explained. So I thought I would start out since we're on Zoom. I had some fun with this one. It's titled Gertrude's Virtual Salon During a Pandemic. Gertrude Stein goes stir crazy, missing those creative salons in her living room, a place where she expresses herself and allows others to join in, showing paintings and sharing writing. She has Alice B set up Zoom meetings and assigns her as chief moderator, Gertrude not having time for such things. Picasso sits behind the black cube on screen. Alice B tells him to click his video on so he can be seen. He tells her she must be mistaken as he sees her and her dog. He tells her to move her face closer as her poodle basket licks her cheek. Alice B tells Hemingway he's being too loud as he shakes martinis for himself. He pontificates Mencken saying martinis are the only American invention as perfect as the sonnet. He'd rather be sitting in silence, writing a short story about a Cuban woman and petting his polydactyl cat, Snowball. Every time he speaks, F. Scotch Fitzgerald's voice echoes so much that everyone tells him something is wrong with his sound. He signs out and rejoins. Is that any better? It's worse. Hemingway rudely tells him to mute. Papa stands up, revealing his X-rated boxer shorts. Gertrude makes her long-awaited appearance. The others see her mouth moving but don't hear a thing. They tell Gertrude to unmute herself. No one can hear you. Alice B in the same house tells her she's muted. Gertrude swears she's never been mute in her life. It's their problem if they don't understand what I'm saying. So you can tell that uh, <laughs> I, I've been on Zoom a little long that I, <laughs> I just thought that I would do something fun with that. And so I write a a lot about nature, birds, and so um, the next few poems I'll write are in that theme. This is called Night Bandits. There's not one raccoon on my porch tonight. There's a quartet of vandals feasting on cat food I left outside for neighborhood cats. I don't like neighbors who allow their cats to run outside to fight with other cats or to get pregnant so there's more to feed, or catch diseases from squirrels or wild raccoons. All bandits of my good-natured feeding of songbirds and striped woodpeckers. 
I enjoy watching daily visits of cardinals, nut hatches, and house finches. At night, the birds are off nesting somewhere. My curtains shut, lights down, and I'm ready for rest, reading or watching Golden Girl reruns. I hear scuffling outside. The bandits of Church Street are shoving the cat dishes across the porch, attempting to force more food out of empty containers. I catch their faces peering back at me. They're not scared. When I go to sleep tonight, dreaming of cats and feathered friends, they'll be taunting my cats through the window, ruining the petunias I bought back to life, destroying the third hummingbird feeder, again, reminding me they know where I live. <laughs> and so this is an ode to starling. Oh, most beautiful bird, your wings are iridescent, rainbow spots glowing in the sun, your yellow beak and feet bright as you light on my hanging bird feeders. Grandma called you dirty birds, chased you off her feeders, made grandpa hang aluminum pie tins in trees to flash and clang in hopes of chasing you away. You're an invasive species. You take over my seed feeders, chase all my favorite songbirds into trees. You strut over, help yourself to dry kibble left out for cats, unafraid of their clawing wrath. You steal the suet I placed in graded holders for woodpeckers. Yet, I can't chase you off or set up deflection in hopes you won't vex me anymore. You are my link to Shakespeare. And I know Gloria said she liked uh, crows, and so I threw one in for about ravens. <laughs> ravens, the largest of songbirds, my totem animal. An honor since a raven's intelligent level rivals chimpanzees and dolphins. Problem solvers, these birds figure out complex puzzles, adapt to weather changes, food supply. They talk better than parrots when they hang with humans. Never more will I look at corvids the same. I always thought them the black sheep of birds, cast aside as evil, as exercised spirits possessing trickster power. Some worship ravens as messengers of the gods. They can sign to communicate by pointing their beaks or holding objects to gain attention of other birds. A flock of ravens is known as an unkindness, a conspiracy. Yet they possess empathy and fall for fewer fallacies than many human beings. September, my, my birth month, so I had to throw it in here. Sunlight glows low through my windows, a changed position from high summer light, the golden hour that casts a robust yellow glare across roads, signs, rearview mirrors, blinding reflections surrender to sunset sooner each day. Hummingbirds fatten for long flights. Some are solitary. They share nectar at last. Dry corn stalks stiffen, stiffen in fields, waiting for harvest. Leaves fall to the ground. Pumpkin spice scents. Apples ripen into cider amid bushels of fall festivals. Perennial as forget-me-nots. And so this is kind of a cross between nature and then getting into more humanistic type writing. This is titled Healing Nature. I hear songbirds chirping and feel calm, a respite from a world that's filled with guns, gaudy lies, and fake news. A world where my mom talks to my dead grandma as if she's in the back seat of my car, asking what she wants to order from Dairy Queen. Where mom's falls become more frequent. Where I feel like her mother telling her to go to the bathroom, when to go to bed, that she needs to eat. She fights me about her bedtime as if she's 10. I fight with myself as to how much longer I can deal with being her caregiver as she looks at me and asks where I went, why I won't tell her where her mom is. 
The outside world is fighting too over how much more we can take without someone to protect us from the violence, the lies, the poverty. It's hard not to give up, but the birds ground me with their frequency. Their songs lift me to Zen, a state where I long to live. And so I had to write a poem about something that bothers me when us boomers get blamed for everything. So I decided to do that. It's titled, OK Boomer. <laughs> what happened to the flower children, the hippies with love beads, peace medallions, Nehru jackets, tie-dyed t-shirts, who carried signs that said, make love, not war, power to the people, marching in San Francisco, holding sit-ins at Berkeley. Boomers were cool. We participated in protests and love-ins. The Beatles sang, come together. At Woodstock, Grace Slick turned on with White Rabbit. We were tuned in. We were golden. We were going to change the world. Dylan sang the answers are blowing in the wind. Social change was coming. It was going to be a revolution. Our generation was smarter. Collars popped everywhere. We were anything but square. Can you dig it? Free love and our laid back ways would end wars, end racism. We would liberate gays, women. We loved animals, protected the environment. No silent spring in our future. We had stopped pollution, end pesticides from killing our birds and us. Now we're turned off. Boomers are gray, tired, wrinkled lifelines from fighting the establishment, the knockoffs of White Rabbit and blowing in the wind, selling celebrity cruises and Budweiser. We're the ones younger generations blame for all this wrong with their world. Climate, war, money. The peaceniks of yesterday have not all grown intolerant, not filled with hate, a bit burnout, but boomers are not all deadbeats. And so I tossed in one, thank you for uh, the pandemic. You know, I wrote several, but I thought I wouldn't inundate us with that, <laughs> having to relive it. So seeking comfort in a pandemic I think of grandma a lot on any given day, but in the surreal times we're living in, the pandemic sweeping over us, our certainty unmasked, the social distancing, the empty grocery shelves, I long for her hugs. I yearn for her upstairs bedroom full of goodies she kept there. A child of the Great Depression, grandma always shopped to stock up. If here, I need not worry about making grocery runs for staples. I could walk a block down the street to her house for rolls of paper towels, toilet paper, bags of sugar, cans of coffee, boxes of Kleenex, bottles of rubbing alcohol, piles of colorful braided throw rugs, all kinds of aspirin, Tums and bottles of paragoric, all her cure-all for stomach aches. I never knew until recently it contained opiates. She also had 16 ounce bottles of Coca-Cola, always in supply. In her freezer, bacon, round steaks, and boxes of maple creams and meldaways, her plentiful stash of Lowry's chocolate candies, handmade in Muncie. My daughter said, don't you wish grandma was still here? If we had run out of something, we could just go to her house and restock. We reminisced her hoarding ways. I wondered if this moment in time will instill that need in our younger generations to stock up whenever they can, because they'll remember those bare shelves at the grocery and the sudden unknowing of what the future holds. And so this takes us into a few poems about family. So, Lured to water. I saw the Atlantic Ocean for the first time in my 30s. I fell in love with its rolling waves coming to me, the seagulls screaming overhead, the endlessness of the water's body, witnessing the moon's reflection 
gleam on every ripple. My first memory of being around water was staying at Aunt Mary's house in Michigan. She lived year round on Pleasant Lake. At six, I was allowed only on the pier where I found it exciting to dangle my feet into that cool lake. At night, I loved hearing the waves slap against the concrete wall as I drifted to sleep. Years later, married to my first husband, we spent every weekend at Lucan's Lake from Memorial Day until summer's end. I learned to tie lures and fly fish in a bass boat on that deep lake. We'd go for pontoon rides, floating for hours with my in-laws and our miniature poodles, all enjoying the breeze, picnicking on potato chips, ham salad, and iced tea. During those good years, our daughters were born. They were at the beach with me from playpen until they learned to swim in the shallow end. I moved near Lake Erie for six years during my 50s, where discovering the migrating warblers passing through each spring on their route to Canada brought me delight. At the docks, a grouping of restaurants overlooking the Maumee River, I ate walleye or drank margaritas with friends while watching bridges lift for barges making their way to Michigan. These days, I'm drawn to water in efforts to resuscitate my spirit, to meditate on memories, to appreciate the present. Still, my bond with water never pushed me to dive in, learn how to swim. So that surprises people that I don't know how to swim still after all these years. <clears throat> I pass over its bridges. I cross the Mississinawa River to get groceries, to meet friends, to go to church, to carry art to exhibits, to visit the cemetery where my ancestors are buried. Each time I pass over its bridges, <clears throat> singing, can't buy me love at the top of my lungs while riding in the back seat of mom and Bobo's Buick on our trips for ice cream at Dairy Dream. Memories of mom before dementia set in, always driving. Of dad laughing when we'd crossed the wooden bridge in Granville, its rickety racket making me panic. Of my own daughters giggling over boys in the back seat as we drove home from miniature golf or from Pizza King. Of Mark singing Sun Arise along with Alice Cooper in his Red Vega after one of our movie dates. Of riding school bus number 26 to Delta on Highway 3. Bill and I sailing south, heading towards our honeymoon, toward our honeymoon in Florida, of crossing at pregnant, traveling home with two daughters three years apart, of driving to work in Muncie, selling sweepers as a single mom, after carrying years of marital fear, unkind words, and tears across that bridge, of seeing that bald eagle perched among autumn leaves, after leaving mom in hospice, driving home alone across the familiar river. So I have several poems that I have that are car themed. And so I'm thinking about putting together a chapbook of, of themed cars throughout my life. <clears throat> Slide land. Um, if you could uh, just read maybe two more poems and then we'll move on to the art. Okay. Okay. That would be good. All right. So um, I will read um, How to Lose Your Mom Over and Over. This is one that I recently wrote about uh, dealing with my mom and her de dementia. After her hard falls from messy accidents, you give in to the reality room. Mom is too hard to handle at home since dementia has deteriorated her health in these two years you've been sole caregiver. Confined to her wheelchair, it's a mystery how she escaped the first nursing home you thought extremely secure. You're thankful she didn't become a statewide silver alert in that chilly October air. With mom settled into a new facility, you make it through at first Christmas without her at family gatherings. Visit her four or five times a week. Adapt to others' well-meaning phrase, you're so lucky, at least you still have your mom. 
Never expect a pandemic lockdown of nursing homes or that her hugs from last March will have to hold you. Call her often. She doesn't understand why you're not visiting. She cries hearing your voice. You never know how to hang up. Some are a reprieve of outdoor visits with masks, six feet apart, no hugs, no touching. Hard for her to understand the need for distance. She accuses you of not caring whether she's dead or alive, then begs to drive. So much for happy visits. In autumn, her nursing home locks down again. You're thankful they have no COVID-19 cases until they do in late October. Then the call, your mom has a fever sp spike. Nurses assure you she's tested negative twice. In November, she's isolated in the COVID unit, afraid and alone. Her nurses call several times. Your mom is yelling nonstop. We don't know how to calm her down. Upsetting since no visits are allowed. That Monday, go stand outside her window. She recognizes you, but she's a shell of herself. Her death glares you in the face. Hospice needs to be called on Friday the 13th. Honey, your mom is going to meet Jesus. It won't be long. These words are hard to hear any time, but when you can't be there, it's cruel. You're isolated, lost. You hope she's in a better place. No, she hated the rest home, being forced to play bingo, being limited to that wheelchair, never knowing why her parents weren't visiting. And so I'll end with one that I know that Gloria shares a love of the Beatles. So this is a poem that I wrote recently about a concert that I attended in 2002, and it's called Something Remember, Something Remembered. Paul McCartney concert in Indianapolis, 2002. I saw him standing there, the familiar face illuminated while playing bass guitar. I stood trembling at the songs he sang, singing along to every word. Seeing Paul, my dream beetle, second only to my favorite, George. When the Fab Four played the Indiana State Fair in concert 37 years ago, I was too young to see them, according to mom. My third grade classmate, Gladys, got to go. I was jealous. It didn't matter, the crowd's screams kept her from hearing them sing. Now, the audience has aged. Fewer screams, longer applause, but more tears, induced by happiness, nostalgia. When Paul plunked the ukulele and sang something in tribute to our missing George, my heart went boom, filled with a lifetime of love and gratitude for Beatles music that recalls the magic of my many yesterdays. Thank you. <laughs> and so am I able to share some? Uh, yes, I, I have you on. Um, All right. Uh, share, so. All right. Good work, whoops, let me close my screen here. I don't know why my screen came up, but I'm trying to get rid of it. There we go. Can you see my? Yes. Yes. This is uh, titled um, After Vaccines Nevermore, and it's pastel. And so if anybody has any questions, um, this is an all the rave raven. Did you see it change? the picture change yes okay i just wanted to make sure it was working <laughs> okay so, yes and so um the other one was pastel this was acrylic and so i paint a lot of birds i paint a lot of cats and i like to do um, people portraits but recently i've been doing some where i just let my imagination run wild with the uh, with the birds and so this happened to be one of them this is a picture cat lover that uh, won best of show in November at one of the art shows here in Indiana. And it's pastel. This is pastel and it's called Contemplating Gauguin. 
And I took that from a reference photo of one of my friends. We were up looking at the Gauguin uh, uh, exhibit in Chicago, obviously way before the pandemic hit. Um, but I, I've won a lot of awards with that. Here's a crow with Cheetos. <laughs> so that's a little something out of the imagination as well. I see crows in parking lots quite a bit. So this is an acrylic um, enchanted garden. And here's um, with the pandemic and stuff. This was one of my first ones that I did with the plague mask for a uh, cardinal. And I've got four kitties and I've inherited my mom's too, but these are my four kitties during the pandemic. So I titled it COVID Conscious Cats. And so that went in the one right before it with the uh, uh, plague mask are both in an exhibit down in Terre Haute, Indiana right now. And this is a pastel that I had fun with, just doing something a little bit different, not including the parents in there, but you know, the parents are right there. And I have a, a, a flash pic fiction piece that's coming out in a, in a horror anthology later this year. And this is an illustration that I did for that. And it's charcoal. This is a self-portrait. Um, back home in Indiana, and it's, I put the cardinal on my shoulder for something a little bit fun. And there's a crow, <laughs> and it's actually titled Some Crow. I've won a few awards with that one too. And this is a raven. And I titled this one Three Poets, and that's uh, me with two of my poetry friends. Uh, that was taken, uh, the actual, photo that I used as a reference from was taken in St. Louis. We did a poetry reading there. And then the final one is one of me with the crow on my shoulder. And it's one that I just put there for fun. And I just thought that was a good way to, you know, remember 2020 summer with masks, sunglasses, you're all, you know, covered up. So I am willing to take any questions or comments i'll, I'll start out with one in, all right um why crows why animals i've always loved animals being an only child I, you know i've just you know always uh, related to animals and then in my adult life i've you know, turn that love into um, birds and feeding birds. But I just find crows and ravens both so fascinating because they're so smart. And, you know, as a child, I never gave it a thought that how smart that the birds were, you know, they're just birds. And, you know, crows and ravens, I think, do get a bad, bad rap, like my, my poem says. And, um, you know, they're just, you know, common collars you know they're not as striking as what we think of as like a yellow you know goldfinch or a, a cardinal or some of the you know the bluebirds and stuff and so i think uh, my way of painting them especially is giving them a little bit more attention that i feel they deserve Other questions or? Don't be shy. Well, I can ask another one and then I hope someone else will. <laughs> okay. Um, if I don't lose my train of thought here. <laughs> um, uh, with, with going to dog and cat shows, um, how many people ask you to paint usually a picture of their dog or cat? Because I'm sure you get that a lot. Actually, I get more people that uh, ask me to paint their cats and dogs that have passed on, which is kind of sad. <laughs> 
but I got that a lot. And so um, I did do a lot of commission work when I would go out and do the um, cat and dog shows. I haven't done any of those for a while. I've just been pretty much exhibiting in um, juried exhibits and, and um, I've recently, well, the last couple of years, I've joined the Fort Wayne Artist Guild here in Indiana, and they've had several pop-ups where I've sold a lot of, of pictures, and several of them have been birds, and one was a cat. So <laughs> that keeps me knowing I'm on the right track. <laughs> Plus, it's hard to, I think, but I've heard other people disagree with me, but I think it's hard to paint people and then try to sell them to people that don't know them unless it's like a figure or kind of half turned or backs to them. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Anyone else? I guess everybody's shy today. <laughs> I know. You know, I feel like I'm teaching one of my classes. It's like pulling teeth to get people to talk on Zoom. It's like if you're there in person, I think you would have a lot more <laughs> interaction for whatever that is. I, I appreciate the applause, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have your hand raised? Did you want to ask a question? Or was that just applause? Hi, can I ask a question? Of course. Thanks. I tried to ask it in chat, but it wouldn't go through. There was oh. no no chat option. Oh, okay. So maybe that's why people aren't asking questions. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was wondering, for how long have you been painting? Oh, well, I've been doing some kind of art ever since I was a child. That's, you know, what I really wanted to grow up to be was an art teacher which I have given a few art workshops here and there, but um, the other thing I wanted to do was be a cartoonist. And I guess with the uh, graphic novels and graphic poetry things coming out, I need to turn some attention to that. But seriously, where I've really been painting to either sell or do series, it's probably been in the last 10 years that I've really been pushing it more. Thank you for that question. Thank you for answering. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yes, I do have the chat off. I'm sorry. It's because of bombers and I found oh. it's less likely for that to happen. So that's, yeah, okay. that's understandable. We don't need the people to come in to wreak havoc. <laughs> no, so I tighten security a lot. Yeah, so that's I good. understand that fully. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else with a question? Okay, so I guess that is it. And thank you, Lailan, so much. Well, well, thank you for having me so much. I mean, <laughs> I was honored to be asked and, you know, I love to, it's been such a long time since I've had a chance to read my poetry in front of anybody. So it's kind of nice to have a little audience. <laughs> Yes, for sure, for sure. And yes. thank you for reading the uh, Beatles poem. <laughs> I actually have a, a book I'm working on called Screaming for Paul. So ah, it, ah. it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I've read or, or, I've, or I've seen you or heard you talk about liking the Beatles and stuff. So I knew that, you know, I've got um, probably a series. I write about the Beatles, but I write about them more overall or like more about George and stuff but I've been thinking about putting together maybe a chat book of like uh, pop mm -hmm. music or you know have that kind of theme pop yeah. culture I hope you do yeah. So yeah anyway can we give her a round of applause and you can use the um, reaction emoji or live <laughs> thank you Thank you so much. I appreciate you all spending your Saturday afternoon with me for a while. Okay. Well, thank and I you. thank you for advertising and put this together, Gloria. It's been You're very welcome. nice. You're welcome. And I hope to see you in soon, sometime in person soon. Oh, sometime soon. <laughs> for sure. Yes. Well, thank yes. you, everybody. Okay. And that's it. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>